Welcome to my introductory programming class that uses the C programming language. So I want to teach you two things in this course. Uh, and I make the assumption that you've never programmed before. So the first thing I intend to teach you is how do you represent problems using programming logic. The other thing is to teach you uh, at least an introductory version of the C programming language. You need to know both of these things in order to be a computer programmer. And the first of these is probably the more difficult to learn. The C language uh, was originally created in the early 1970s by Dennis Ritchie. And the version we're going to learn is often referred to as C89 or sometimes C90. And it's based upon the 1989 ANSI standard. Prior to that standard, which was the first C standard, different compiler makers, and a compiler is the tool that processes your code and turns it into something the computer understands. Prior to that standard, the same exact programming code may not do exactly the same thing depending on which compiler you're using. So when the first standard came out, then anybody who had an ANSI uh, compliant compiler agreed that their code would, or that uh, code that was compiled by their tool would function the same exact way. Now, since then, there have been three other standards, that is, of, as of 2020, which is when I'm making this video. There was an update to the standard in 1999, there was one in 2011, and the latest was in 2018. So if there have been three standard updates since 1989, why am I teaching C89? Because as far as I know, C89 is the only one of the standards that is guaranteed to be supported completely by all modern C compilers. Uh, there's a number of modern C compilers and some of those support various amounts of the other standards, but maybe not all of the other standards. Now there may be some C compilers, I'm not well versed with lots of different C compilers, but there may be some that say support all of C99, which is based on the 1999 standard, but not all modern C compilers support C99. Uh, specifically, uh, as of 2020, Visual Studio still only supports C89 completely. I think it supports some features from C99, but not all of C99. So by me focusing on C89, then whatever I teach you, I know has to work on any modern C compiler. Another thing to keep in mind is that the bulk of what's considered C or legal C was established for the C89 standard anyway. So the other things have been added, you know, add additional capabilities, but the bulk of what I think you need to know can be accomplished using C89. So why learn C? Well, C is a lower level language than some other popular languages. For example, Python is very popular right now and it's considered a much higher level language than C. So what does that mean? Well, in general, the higher the level of the language, the more work that the language does for you. For example, if you want to sort some numbers, you may have a function that when given those numbers, you just say, well, just sort these. You may not have to write the logic to do that. Now, uh, one of the things that makes Python very popular is that it has libraries to do just about anything. And so you can write, you know, say 100 lines of code to accomplish a tremendous amount of things. But as you get into lower level languages, the programmer is responsible for writing more of the code to do those things. So why would anybody want to use a lower level language as opposed to a higher level language? Well, lower level languages give you more control to do things. And in fact, the Python interpreter is actually written in C. So if somebody wrote a very big program in C that then allows you to write code in Python. So C gives you a lot of control, but also expects you to do a lot of work. That's the trade-off. Another benefit to learning the C program language is what we would call a root language. So just like with spoken languages, you have root versions of those languages that other languages are derived from, C could be th thought of as the parent to C++. 
because originally C++ was a superset of C. And then if you think of Java as being based to some degree upon C++, at least a lot of the ideas, if we extend this idea, then Java, in a sense, is like the grandchild of C. So there are many languages that share some syntax similarities with C. So learning C, even if you don't ultimately program with C, is not necessarily a bad thing. And then another reason why people often choose C is when you care about performance. Because of the fact that you have so much control over what's happening, uh, if you care about performance in terms of how fast the program runs or how much memory is being used or whatever, C is often a popular choice, especially over scripting languages like Python or, or Perl, for example. So in the simplest sense, in terms of things that we can do in any programming language is to store information. And we store information in variables. Now in C, we have to specify what the variable type is when we're creating the variable. And once we specify that type, there's no changing it. We'll discuss many more variable types later, but the three that will allow us to write most of our code are the int, the double, and the char. An int can only represent integers. So that's zero positive integers or negative integers. A double can represent integers as well, but it also can represent numbers with decimal portions, like my example here, 1.98. But I still could represent the three numbers that I've given you for my int here. I could represent one, 208, or negative 19. And finally, a char is used to represent characters uh, specifically from the American English uh, language. And so that's things like capital A, the number seven as a character, and the question mark. And over time, we'll introduce a few others and also talk about the decision-making trade-offs that occur when you choose the different variable types. So in C, if I want to create a variable, I have to specify a type, and I have to declare that variable. So in this example, when I write int age, I'm saying that age is of type int. And then later on, I've written age equals 45. So at this point, I'm assigning a value to age. Now, if at the time that I created age, I knew what the initial value was, I could have done that as one step, int age equals 45, and note, though, regardless, each of these, what we would call statements, is terminated by a semicolon. So what are considered legal variable names? Well, in C, legal variable names begin with a letter or an underscore. And note that underscores have meaning to programmers that, that uh, typically indicate they're used for something like system programming. So you probably shouldn't get in the habit of naming all your variables beginning with underscores because that tells people that you're going to use it in a different way, although it is technically legal. Once you've gotten past the first letter, you can have other letters or underscores or numbers now, but you can't have spaces in a variable name. So that's the reason why if I want to write something like this, first name, and make it look like a space, I would need to use an underscore. Variable names can't be the same as keywords. That is, words that have specific meaning in the language. I've already shown you on the previous slide here, or this one up here, that int, double, and char, these are all keywords because they have particular meaning in, when we're declaring variables. So it would be illegal to say, I'm gonna create a variable of type double that's named int. Because now when you're trying to compile it, it confuses the computer. So I can't use keywords as variable names. And finally, keep in mind, that variable names are case sensitive. So within the same program, I could have a variable called name all in, in lowercase, and also have a variable called name that's been capitalized. In most cases, I wouldn't do this because of the mistakes I, as the programmer, am likely to make. This wouldn't be a problem for the computer. It's perfectly fine to do this or any of the other variations on how I capitalize the letters and name. The problem would be that it would be very easy as a programmer for me to intend to write N-A-M-E all in lowercase, but accidentally I capitalize it, and then I create a bug 
that it's hard for me to track down because both of these are valid names in that particular program. So in general, I'd say don't do something like this in the same program. We often need to be able to do math with the values that we store in variables. And so we have the same basic operators you have in math. The plus sign, the minus sign, star for multiplication, slash for division, the equal sign for assignment. We'll talk more about that. There's many more operators. We'll introduce some of these over time. Um, but in terms of using those basic operators, one place for it's very easy to make a mistake is that in C, when I divide an integer by an integer, I get an integer. So look at the code I have at the bottom. Here I've declared three variables, top num, bottom num, and answer. And technically I could have put all these on the same line, but I just chose to do it this way. And I gave initial values to top num and bottom num. So later on when I say top num, which is nine, divided by bottom num, which is four, and I assign that value to answer, answer now has the value two, not two and a quarter. Because this is integer division, nine divided by four, is two in C, if these are both ints. If they were doubles, that'd be a different story. But these are all ints, so I have integer divided by integer gives me an integer. And that would be this right here. Another operator, which we'll go ahead and introduce now, because it actually gets used quite a bit in programming, is what's called the modulus operator. And in C, we use the percent sign for that. So it actually returns the remainder from integer division. So how does this work? Let's see that real fast. So when I write um, 9 divided by 4, right? when I was first learning division in elementary school, I would get the answer this way. I have a 9, I draw the symbol around it, put the 4 out here, and I say 4 goes into 9 two times, 2 times 4 is 8, 9 minus 8 is 1, 4 won't divide evenly into 1, so I say there's a remainder of 1. And that may be how you learn to originally do division. So when I write 9 divided by 4, where these are both ints, that gives me the 2. When I write what we say is 9 mod 4, that gives me the 1. So that's how this works. Now there's different ways to deal with negative numbers for the modulus operator, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. So what does a program look like? This is our basic structure of a program. In fact, this would be considered a le legal C program, even though it really doesn't do anything. Every program we write will begin, well actually we may change the void, but the vast majority of the programs we write will say int main void we'll have a set of matching curly brackets, and then we'll have code between the curly brackets. This, what's in the middle here, is actually an example of a comment in C. So I could compile this code and run it, it just wouldn't do anything, because I don't really tell it to do anything, but this is perfectly legal. But this is the simplest program I know how to write. So here's a longer program. So we'll get to this in a moment. The top part here is called a preprocessor directive, but it says we pronounce this as pound include standard io.h. And then here's my int main void. Here's my starting curly bracket. Here's my closing curly bracket that matches this because I may have multiple places where I have curly brackets. I've declared three variables, age, old, and weight, and given age an initial value. I could have put all three of these on the same line, but I just chose to do it this way for variety. And then later on, I give weight its value, once again for variety. I could have said weight equals 180 right here. Here's where I'm gonna give old its value. Old is equal to two times age, so two times 41 is what would be stored in old. And then I have three print statements. Printf is our printing function that's in what we call the standard library, and I'll talk about those later in another lecture. But it's not part of the core language. So the pound includes standard IO is actually here because I'm using printf. So when I compile and run this program, here's the output. You weigh 180 pounds, you're 41 years old, people twice your age are 82 years old. 
So I've said a couple times that we need to compile programs. And in modern times, when you're using a compiler, you press a button that does all the behind the scenes work for you. So depending on your compiler, it may say you need to build the code or compile the code or whatever. But there's actually lots of steps taking place in the background. And even though in many cases you don't need to worry about what's taking place, I think it's helpful to know for some particular situations. And also, if you happen to be a computer programmer, it's even more helpful, I think, to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So you start off with your source code. That's what we just looked at. So on the previous slide, this is source code. It's something that's meaningful to the human, but in its current form, it doesn't actually do anything. It won't actually run and do something. We have to compile it and ultimately turn it into something the computer understands, which takes multiple steps. But before we can compile it in C, the preprocessor has to go through and check for stuff. So the preprocessor looks at this and says, oh, you said you wanted to include this library so that way I understand what printf means. Without this line right here, you'd get an error message saying, I don't know what printf means. The C compiler understands void. It understands int. It understands double and while, which we'll see later, and many other keywords. But it doesn't know what print means. So this preprocessor directive includes the library needed to do this work, or at least that what we'd call the header file. All right. Then once the preprocessor's done its work, and the preprocessor actually can do a tremendous amount of stuff, but, but by the time it's finished, then the compiler has everything it needs to try to translate the C source code we just saw into what's called assembly language. Assembly language is tied to a particular processor. So when you've heard about Intel processors or ARM processors or AMD processors or other manufacturer processors, they each have their own assembly language, which is a very low level of instructions. So the C compiler actually translates to assembly language that's specific to your processor. Then another tool called an assembler translates that into executable code. But it's possible to have the program divided up into multiple pieces and to compile those separately. So we actually need some way of pulling those compiled pieces together and that's the job of the linker. And so after the linker's done its work, we're finally end up with an executable file. So if you're coming from the Windows world, you're used to seeing programs have the extension exe. And so those are all executable files. And so they went from the original source code to what you have installed on your computer. But for the most part, you don't have to worry about this. You just say build and magic happens. So what should you do to write quote unquote good programs? You could come up with different criteria by which you may say one program is better than another. But I've identified five criteria that I think are common measures of deciding one program is better than another. And I'm going to promote some of these because this is an introductory programming course. The first thing on the list is readability. And that is, did you write the code in such a way that somebody looking at the code, and this somebody could be you a year from now, can that person look at the code and easily understand what you wanted to do? There's actually a contest called the Obfuscated C Contest in which the goal is to write unreadable code that still compiles. So you don't want to be a person that writes code like that. And I've actually known people who, because they would not write code in a readable fashion, couldn't maintain their own code and they actually would have to start from scratch if there were problems because they couldn't understand what they themselves were doing. So how could you expect somebody else to look at your code and understand? So I think that's a very important thing that in the vast majority of cases you should focus on. The next criteria by which one program may be better than another is maintainability. Think about something like Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word has been around for decades. So whatever the original Microsoft Word was that was created several decades ago, it's been replaced by altered versions of Microsoft Word over the years. That is, they made changes to it either to fix problems in the original code or to add features to the original code. So Microsoft Word has spent more time in what we would call the maintenance stage 
than it did the original development stage. So as a developer, you want to do things in such a way that if the code has to be modified in the future, it doesn't break everything you have or it's easy to extend or whatever. The next thing on this list is portability. There are lots of different operating systems that you could write and compile a C program on. And in the vast majority of cases, you want your code to be portable. So I, for this course, I will either compile my code on a Microsoft Windows computer, probably using Visual Studio, or I will compile it on a Linux computer using uh, the GCC compiler. What I would like to do is be able to write the code and have it compile and work the same exact way no matter which operating system I'm using. That's called portability. Now, if I was writing you know, operating system level code, for example, to add new users to Microsoft Windows, it might not be possible to write portable code because there would be things that are specific to Windows that I might have to use. But for the vast majority of things I've ever personally written, it's entirely possible to write code that works the same and compiles the same, whether I'm using Windows or Mac or Linux. So I want to have portability. The fourth thing on this list is scalability. Imagine I told you to write a program to print the integers from 1 to 10. Now, one way to do that would to explicitly print each number separately. That is, you have a statement that says print 1, and then you have a statement that says print 2, then print 3, and so forth. That'd be one way to do it, and it wouldn't take a whole lot of work because I'm only printing the integers from 1 to 10. But when we get to loops, we'll learn that an alternative way to do this is to create a loop that goes from 1 to 10, and on each iteration of the loop, it prints the current number. So as the loop repeats, it prints 1, prints 2, prints 3. So if I'm only printing the integers from 1 to 10, there's not a tremendous amount of work difference between the two, although the loop would actually take less effort. But what if I said, well, I didn't really want to go from 1 to 10. I want to go from 1 to 100. Well, in the case of the loop, I simply change the 10 to 100, and I'm done. But if I'm explicitly printing each number separately using separate print statements, then the first version requires me to add 90 more print statements. So that program's not scalable. And this is one of the things, as a programming instructor, I've always struggled to get students on board with learning to do. Because as an introductory programming student, it's very easy to focus on the current task and not think about how the program might be used later. All you care about is getting the answer now that, and not thinking about how the program might be changed. But you, for real world programs, you want to be thinking about scalability because you don't have to start from scratch every time you change something. And then the last criteria that I'm going to talk about is performance. In most cases, that's, that means things like, well, how long does your program take to do what you need to do? Or how much memory does it use up while it's working? Uh, for this course, that's never really an issue if you write the programs correctly. Um, you know, if, for the type of programs that I would use in an introductory programming class, you know, maybe, maybe the well-written program takes a millisecond to run, and maybe the poorly written program takes one second. So there's a factor of a thousand difference between them. But to the human, you don't hardly notice the difference. But in real world programs, you can notice the difference because instead of working with, say, 10 numbers like I described in my scalability example, maybe you're dealing with 100 million numbers or a billion objects. So performance can matter. And performance can literally be days in terms of difference, in terms of how long it takes to do something and how you write things. So which of these should you do? Well, the reality is there's many situations in which you may not be able to maintain all five of these, or that is, you may not be able to achieve the best in each of these criteria. And your particular problem may decide that performance is more important than portability, or portability is more important than maintainability or whatever. You just have to decide that when you get there. But I want you to at least be aware of these types of considerations and choose what's appropriate for your situation. So since I'm teaching programming, let's go back to that list. The ones that I tend to focus on when I teach programming are readability and scalability. And so I'm gonna promote those, so let's look into those.
So there's a number of things you can do to improve readability. I've narrowed them down to these four things. Meaningful variable names, comments, white space, and indentation. So let's look at each of those. Meaningful variable names is important, right? So let's look at two different versions of the same code. In the top version, I declare two variables, A and B, and give those initial values of 10 and 5, respectively. And I declare a third variable, C. And let's imagine that 20 lines later is when I finally add A and B together and assign them to C. Is this correct? Well, legally, this is a valid statement. The computer would have no problems with saying C equals A plus B. But what if I'd accidentally written C equals A times B? Well, that's also legal. But there's nothing that demonstrates the context that this represents. I don't know what A and B mean. They're just letters of the alphabet that I wrote. But what if these represented base, uh, basic business ideas of costs? So instead, I use this version. I say, okay, I have a labor cost of 10, a materials cost of 5, and then I understand that the total cost is equal to labor cost plus materials. So if I saw this statement and I'd mistakenly written it as total cost equals labor cost times materials, because I understood what it's supposed to do, I'd understand that that was a mistake, even though legally it's a valid statement. So this one does nothing to help me understand if it's valid. This one does, and it improves the readability of the code. All right? So you should look for using meaningful variable names when possible. Now there's a couple of exceptions. Now, as I demonstrate code later, as I introduce other program concepts, it's very common for me to use single variable names. And so I'm, I will appear to be a hypocrite. But the reason for that is I don't have context. I'm just showing you how to add numbers or multiply numbers to show you can do it. I'm not showing you an actual usage. Whenever you're doing something that has a legitimate purpose, you should be using meaningful variable names. When we get to loops, we'll find though the convention is to use single letters to represent loop counters. And so that will be the other major exception. And if you don't do that, then you are the one who appears crazy. All right? Another thing that I think readable code does is to use comments wisely. That doesn't be put a comment on every single line explaining what the line does. And I have seen students do that before but one of the problems with that is that then there's so many comments, they sort of bury the programming logic itself. And so it, it hides what it is you're trying to do. And so you should use some comments. In C89, there's only one legal way of writing comments, and that is to enclose them with the characters slash star with no space and then star slash with no space. Now, I could put these on the same line to represent a single line comment. For example, this line right here could be after this. Or I could have multiple line comments. Like maybe I have a whole paragraph of something I want to say, and I enclose those in slash, star, star, slash. Now, in C99 and C derivative languages like C++ and Java, it's also legal to have single line comments using slash, slash. But C89 only supports this way of writing comments. So when should you use comments? Well, certainly not for everything you do, but they should be there to improve the readability of the code and to help people understand what's going on. So look at this example. Imagine I gave you the code for calculating pi using the fast Fourier transform. For the vast majority of people on the planet, if they simply looked at that code, they'd have no clue what they were looking at. So it would be helpful to put this comment in there saying, here's what this is doing. So if you need to modify this code, you can do some research into what the fast Fourier transform is and how it's used to calculate pi. All right, so I consider that a meaningful comment. Another example of a good comment might be that um, there might be things that traditionally are done, are done a certain way and you're choosing to deviate from that for some reason. For example, we'll see that lots of the code we write will have counters, and counters often begin at zero or one. But what if I had a situation where I needed the counter to start at 10? Well, I might put in a comment saying, I put, I'm actually using 10 here instead of zero or one, and here's the reason why. 
without the comment, somebody looking back at my code may think that it's a typo, that I really meant zero or one and I accidentally typed both numbers together to start with 10. So I might have that comment there to help. Here's an example though of a useless comment. I've used a meaningful variable name here, assuming this variable actually represents your age. So there's no reason to have this comment over here telling me what this is. If age represents your age, I would just say int age and leave it at that. Don't put this. Indentation and white space are kind of like the, the way that when you write uh, a book, paragraphs are indented, you have section headers, you maybe have white space to separate sections, things like that to improve readability. But this code right here is completely legal. And the compiler will have no problems reading this and doing what it says. The C programming language gives you a tremendous amount of freedom in terms of how you indent or use white space. Now, what would be illegal here would be to make all this actually one line. I do need to have the preprocessor directive on a separate line from the rest. But the int main void and then the block of code here, this is perfectly fine to the computer. The problem is I, as the programmer, have trouble reading it. So what I would do instead might be something like this. Here's the preprocessor directive. Here's a blank line. It main void, curly bracket, lined up with the other curly bracket. And then here's the body of the main function is what all this is. I would argue this is much easier to read than this. Even though to the computer, they're both the same. They both function the same, they compile the same. There's no difference between the two from the compiler's perspective. It's for the, the human. Now, let's talk about something that people get into fights over. Where should you put the curly brackets? For a long time, I would line them up like this. Over time, I've started to move to where I take the starting curly bracket and put it at the end of the preceding line. That's a personal choice, and I think arguments can be made for either one. And so when I was teaching programming classes, I would let students sort of do what they want there, but I would basically say, at least be consistent in what you do. I think you should match up curly brackets because as you begin to add curly brackets to represent different things, and they are required in this sense, we can't leave them out here, but as you begin to add other curly brackets, you want to know which ones go together. And if you're not consistent on how you indent, that makes it very difficult to track down uh, which parts belong to what and then fix bugs. In terms of indenting, you have a lot of freedom there. Over time, I've settled for using four spaces. I've never used tabs because tabs can be defined to represent a different amount of white space. And it can be misleading if you change what the tab assignment is. So I personally never use tabs, but I've settled on using four spaces. Now I've known people who use two spaces. Some people use eight spaces or more. I think four is a good compromise because at least for me, when I look at code, two spaces, or I've even known people to use only one space, one space is definitely very difficult to see where the logic is changing. If you use too much white space, well then longer lines of code begin to wrap and mess up the appearance. So in C, you have a tremendous amount of freedom, but I'd say at least be consistent and use some common sense. So if you're learning to program for the first time, or if you're coming to C from a different program language, what can you do to be successful as a programmer? I think there's no replacement for reading and writing code. There just isn't. Um, if you're new to programming though, obviously you're somewhat limited on how much you can initially write code because you don't know how to do anything yet. So I think it's beneficial to take code that you know works and then run it. Because when you get, pro when you get a program and you don't actually understand what the program does, it's like looking at a box that has a bunch of dials on it and switches. So imagine I give you a box and it doesn't have any labels on it. It just has a bunch of dials and switches and you turn one of the dials and it begins to make a sound. And as you turn it one way, the sound gets louder and you turn it the other way and the sound decreases. And you flip a switch and a light comes on. You turn the switch the other way and the light goes off. 
Well, now you're creating this cause and effect relationship, which helps you understand what the box does. Um, and that goes into the second comment I have here, and that is modify code to see how it affects the results. So that's sort of like when I was saying turn the knobs and flip the switches. There's times that I had code and I didn't completely understand what it did until I started changing values. An example is I create my slides using a type setting language called LaTeX. And because it's a type setting language, you have some control over spacing. And so I found code online before that I didn't completely understand what the spacing meant, or at least how it worked. So for example, let's say that, I'm just making this up, let's say it said the spacing between this line and this line was 50. And so I can see it's about a quarter inch to my eye, at least for the way I'm looking at it right now, this is about a quarter inch apart for the size I have the slides on my desktop. Well, maybe if I change the you know, number to 25, I see these get closer by a half. And so I start to see how those numbers correlate to the distance between things. And so I've had to use that whenever I used a type setting language because the initial numbers didn't mean anything to me. So you can play around with code that way. Another thing that you can do in terms of modifying code is to break it. Break the code in such a way that it doesn't compile. Because when you're an introductory programmer and you're using a compiled language like C, you're going to get lots of compiler errors. I mean, the reality is, if you write very much code, you're going to make mistakes. That's just a fact of life. But the problem as a beginner is, even if the compiler gives you error messages, you don't know what those error messages really mean. So at least if you modify the code and you know why it broke, you can start to see what error messages are produced when you break the code. So that's something you can also can do. And finally, the third thing is, is write small programs to test concepts. If you're trying to understand a new language element, write, say, a five-line program to test out just that element and then save these programs. I have literally hundreds of little C programs that I've written over the years that I use to test concepts so I could better understand them. And then also, in terms of why I saved them, that's so that I can look back at the code later because maybe it took me a little while to understand how to use a particular language element correctly, or maybe it had different features associated with it, and so it took me a long time to understand and get the proper combination of features in order to get what I wanted. But maybe I don't do something like that again for six months or 12 months. Well, in six months or 12 months, I may not remember what I did exactly, and I don't have to start from scratch in order to determine how to do it again correctly. So I'll go back and look at my own code or my own notes that I saved showing how to use that language element correctly. So I think these are all good ways to learn to become a better programmer. And once again, there's no replacement for reading and writing code. So that's the end of my introduction. What we'll talk about in a future lecture will be how do we actually compile the code in order to run things. That is, when I start writing down code, like I showed you on a previous slide, if you take that code and you want to do something with it, how do you compile and run that code? That's what I'll show you in a future lecture.